thanks Devika for that uh, kind introduction. <laughs> so, what that also means is whatever, so I gave him both good and bad feedback. So, if there is a lot of things missing in WSOD, you can blame me also that I didn't give that bad that feedback. So, um, so uh, I'm here to kind of in the next 40 minutes. Um, the title of this, this presentation is Building an Enterprise Path Framework Using Open Source Components. Um, so don't expect at the end of this to have uh, any kind of aha moment to say, okay, now I've figured out how to build a, uh, a pass. Uh, that's, that ain't going to happen. Um, but I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to share um, the journey that we have been through so far, um, some of our experiences, um, and the lessons we have learned, and, and share things that are not necessarily just technical, but some of the organizational other, other challenges in building a platform um, in an enterprise. Um, and, and to do that, let me first start with Trumbull. How many of you, uh, of you had heard of uh, Trumbull before coming to this conference? Ah, oh, okay, a few hands. Um, so it's an irony because we are, we are having this conference here in, uh, in the Bay Area and, Sil in, in, and Trimble was born in the Silicon Valley almost 30 years ago. Um, so, and, and it's, a lot of people say that and we would like to say that it's one of the well-kept secrets of, uh, of the Silicon Valley. Um, Trimble is a, um, though it, is born, it was born in, in California, I wouldn't call it a, a Silicon Valley company or even a U.S. company, for that matter, in its core. Um, because, as you can see, we are globally spread, spread geographically, widespread, not only in, in sales and marketing, but even in our development centers. So we have development centers uh, from Sweden to India to China uh, to uh, you know, various parts of the U.S. and New Zealand. So, so the, that, that thing kind of pretty much covers the whole globe. Um, so it's, a, it's a, a true global company that um, is, is positioned to meet the global challenge. And just to give you an idea, so I talked about the 30 years, so Trimble has um, sort of a two-part history, the first two decades or nearly first half and the second half. Uh, so this kind of gives you an idea of uh, the growth of Trimble, uh, sustained growth in the last, uh, you know, 10, 12, 13 years. Um, and, and you can see that that kind of graph is very rarely seen, even you know, considering the, the, uh, the kind of ups and downs the, the Valley companies have gone through. Uh, so it's a company that has a strong foundation, sustained growth. And you may ask, why am I talking a lot about Trimble? And there is, there is a, a, a theme in here. So I'm going to stage the, 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 the way Trimble is structured, um, how, how we have grown and where we have come and why the past makes perfect sense for us. So, so this is the sort of key, key core areas where we are focused. So um, agriculture, heavy civil construction, um, building constructions, um, cadastral and geospatial, and transportation logistics. Um, the, the company that Devika talked about at road that Trimble acquired through which I came into Trimble, was focused in um, GPS tracking and, and, and sort of what, what is called as mobile resource management. But it, that is just one small part of Trumbull. Um, so the, 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 the key value that we provide is a holistic view, uh, looking at a holistic view of the market and providing solutions. That doesn't mean we, we, we think that only we provide all of the solutions in this market. We do understand we coexist with other solutions, but we provide this, uh, we, we think of this value chain from end to end and provide a, a more um, complete and, 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 and a franchise value to each of these sectors. And then we also have emerging businesses. So these are emerging businesses that give us potential growth to mature into that other, the level of those other sectors that I talked about. So it's a collection of uh, market focused solutions. Um, many are pure software, some are software and hardware. Um, but in every case, the customer comes first. So that's been our mode of operation. So how is this, uh, how are we uh, sort of structured to, to attain this level of uh, growth? 
So um, Trumbull is very divisional in its, in its uh, organizational structure. So the, the corporate part and the division are sort of, uh, you know, focused on two different things. The, the divisions, is, divisions are meant to be very entrepreneurial. Um, so that is the speed and the agility you execute. So we have smaller divisions, each controlling its sort of uh, research, development, um, sales, marketing. So what that gives is that gives the nimbleness to respond to the market. Corporate is more focused on you know consistency and 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 I've, and I've, you know we have this term platform here. Um, so this this covers platforms of all nature. You know whether it's a platform to provide um, support and taxation, platform to provide um, you know software platform to provide support for software application building. So. What the corporate focuses on scalability and, and, and capability. So one is focused towards scalability, the other is um, focused toward market leadership and nimbleness. So what that does is it gives you a unique problem. So it gives you great market solutions, but they create somewhat silo solutions as well. So let's look at that. So uh, before I go in here, um, I wanted to phrase this. So, I'm going to talk about enterprise software platform here. So what's the definition of a platform? Um, we all have our own definitions of platform. Um, you know, we have, we have built monolithic platforms in the old days. We have built platforms and, and waited for people to come and build applications on top of that. So, so this is only a cartoonish uh, slide that I have here. So if you can't read this, what it says is this is a structure and it's an email that goes from uh, a site engineer to a design engineer. It says, steel roof and column already constructed. Kindly send us the foundation drawings. So um, it, it happens, right? So, um, so this, is, this is the dilemma of the, the application group and the platform group. Um, so what are the challenges? So um, when we started uh, in Trumbull, um, we've also had, you know, I wouldn't say um, we have been successful in every attempt. Uh, we have had several uh, attempts and several stories about uh, different platforms. And uh, some of my colleagues here we were talking about, and, and one of them mentioned he's been involved in four platform building uh, through in, in, in his career in Trumbull. So we have done several, several iterations of this. Um, so there's a perceived value gap. So if I walk in and tell my CEO, we're going to build this platform, it's going to be a greatest platform, um, and then life will be very easy. His first question would be, tell me what's the value of that, right? Uh, who wants it? Uh, and so that's always the, the, uh, the, the challenge for a, a software guy to articulate. Team autonomy. So in our structure, the structure that I just explained of divisions and autonomous groups building their own solutions, um, that's a big challenge. So. Every division wants to build their application. They want to focus on the applications. Forget about all the platform crap. We're going to build the solution, and we're going to take it to market. Okay? So there is an organizational challenge. And if you look at Trimble, you, know, you go, to the, go to our website, you won't find a VP of engineering for Trimble. Um, because, as I said, every division has their own uh, structure, their, their own development. So who is going to say, OK, we're going to build this platform? Right? So that's a, that's a big challenge. And then business value thinking. So the GMs who control the division want to build a solution. I want a business value, not a platform. So let me build this application and take it to market. And then traditional platform versus product-driven platform. So what I mean by this is the traditional platform which we have built, um, I've been part of some of them, uh, where we build a platform with all the bells and whistles and say, this is how you're going to build applications on this. That model has not worked well for, for many. And the reason being because by the time the application is, the platform is done, you know, it's two or three years, technology has changed, and also the, the market has gone by. You haven't delivered a solution. So the product-driven approaches, which is one of the ones we have tried now, uh, in, in a, in a, where we built the, the, the pass, is take a product and build a platform elements in the context of that, that product or the solution, and then expand from it. Um, 
So our first implementation of PaaS had um, Identity Manager, App Server, um, API Manager, and ESB. So all of those three components we used from WSO2. We didn't use the whole stack. But then we are incrementally adding to it. So what that does is we are able to then build a, an application on that platform and deliver it and, and show it to uh, the stakeholders and prove it that it can be done. And it can be done efficiently. And that creates momentum within. So the next question is, who owns the shared components? So let's say we decide to do this, um, and we built this great sh uh, shared components as platform. Who owns it? So which means now you need a group that can own it, that can enhance it, that can support it. Um, so that, is, that requires organizational changes. And that has been one of our challenges. But we went through that, and, and we are making those changes to have that organization support. And then the last one is you've got to get the architecture right. Okay. If anybody questions that, you know, ask Sibelius. You know. And she's been grilled for the last two days. And uh, um, the last I heard is they'll have to rebuild the whole application. So. so what is Trimble? Um, so we called our pass is Trimble pass, T pass. Um, and, and the reason for this is also, um, it, is, it is somewhat of a little bit of internal marketing as well. People have to get used to these terms. People have to really you know, start using it and, and, and asking questions of what is, what is TPASS? What is it going to, how is it going to help me? Um, so in our, in our model, and I have some uh, slides to show with the architectural sort of framework in it, but it essentially provides the core services need to build an enterprise application. So we, we heard a lot of presentations today where you know, everybody talks about why do we need to have these you know, mundane things like identity management, API management, why do we need to repeat it in every instance? Why couldn't we have it all done at one, one place? So that's the approach we have taken. And to provide an architectural framework, so um, it, it's, it's, it should provide a framework to build applications um, in a service-oriented architecture. So uh, we heard some presentation today about uh, SOA and how SOA has helped build some great healthcare applications. So it's along the same lines. And also, as the technology is changing, we have a lot of groups that are moving into cloud. So how do we actually build cloud-enabled applications using SOA and, and, and the, uh, uh, the, the reusable components? So what TPASS is, it combines um, a development platform, computing resources, deployment infrastructure, and also the whole management of the, the infrastructure. And, and, and so that you can, you can build it uh, cost effectively in a, in, a, in, a, in a simpler way. So in, in essence, it also provides a scalable infrastructure. And also the final point, which is uh, Trimble has a, a, um, a model where we sell through our partners and our, um, um, our dealers. And they have great need at times to come into our system and exchange data and flow transactions through it. And this would be a great opportunity for us to provide this as a platform for our dealers and our, our uh, partners. So in essence, what TPASS provides is in the, in the first instance when we are building this, all of the core services that you saw coming from WSO2 today. And, and I will go into the details as to why we chose to build it on top of WSO2. And essentially, it provides a cloud container for also to build some of our internal reusable components. So you have the core services, and then you're on top of that, some of the reusable components within the Trimble environment. So one of the examples I've given is reverse geocoding. How many of you know reverse geocoding? Yeah, okay. So given a lat long, you can get uh, an address back. So this is a, a problem that is uh, solved by many of our telematic solutions. So we have about five different telematic solutions for different markets. And today we have five implementations. 
So there's no need to have five of those. You can have just one of them. And, and the reason for that, um, the way it exists today, is because we have grown through acquisitions as well. So every time when you grow through acquisitions, you have a new solution, new platform, and the new implementation comes in. So one of the things we could do is take, take the be best or a new reverse geocoding and put it into this framework so that everybody can share. And also, uh, I talk about this one-click cloud deployment. Um, so this doesn't mean you click and everything is deployed, but that's a goal. So simplify the deployment part. Because one of those challenges that, um, that I've seen, we have, um, and, and I'm sure you, most of you have experienced this as well, when you move into the cloud, the deployment, the DevOps side is complex. It's not like the, the old days. So how do you simplify that? So you need something on top of all of the other stuff that you do to simplify that deployment. And then service metering and charging for services. So when somebody is putting a service out there for sharing, you need to be able to monitor it, you need to be able to meter it, you need to be able to provide mechanism to charge back. And you have to also make it technology agnostic because we have half of Trimble in .NET and half of Trimble in Java. So why use open source? So this was something that um, we were challenged with early on to say, okay, we have all of these great solutions from Oracle and IBM, and why go uh, after open source? So one, was, one way to look at it is it's there, right? It's available. But that shouldn't be the only reason, right? So you have to be, you have to be able to use it. You have to be able to customize it. So our biggest advantage that we found was we can take WSO2 as an open source today. We can customize it. If you don't find everything we need in that, we can customize it. We, can, we don't have to take everything. We just take the part that is needed for us. And that's an important, thing, uh, important criteria for us. And the other one is portability and ownership. So what I mean by that is I want to be able to take my pass, port it across multiple infrastructure services. So we have um, some of our divisions wanting to deploy it in, let's say, Rackspace. Some may want to de deploy it in Amazon. Some may want to deploy it internally in the private cloud. So we want to make it portable. And the, the reason I put in the question mark about vendor lock-in was, so one might argue, are you not getting locked into WSO2? Right? Uh, my answer to that is, um, I'm dependent on WSO2, but it's an open source. Right? I mean, I have the code, and you know, if WSO2 does not provide me the service, I can go elsewhere to get the service, which is not the case today, of course. But you could do that, so you have the flexibility on that. And, and you have definitely the, the cost is a factor. So, um, uh, you know, we, we all have dealt with, um, I have my good friend Mohan sitting here, uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll just talk about IBM. You've talk, we have dealt with IBMs and the Oracles, and, and the upfront cost is an issue. And, and as the systems gets complex, as we need more and more services, if you have to go and get every one of those in the, in the uh, license model that exists today from vendors, uh, non-open source vendors, that can be extremely costly. And the reason is also because the technology is changing so fast, you might have to redo it in a short window again. So you can't just go and acquire another piece of software and then you know, write off that cost that you've incurred. So, and the other one is, what we are doing with the open source is building a platform. And again, nobody wants a platform. No customer wants a platform, right? Customer is interested in a solution. So these are things that we need to, these are all the necessary building blocks that we have to have to build a solution. So why not use the open source? And why not focus on, uh, and I think Jim mentioned that in his uh, uh, morning keynote, that why not focus on the things that you differentiate? Why not focus on providing great telematic solution? Why not focus on um, providing a great connected ag community for integration of all of the uh, agricultural data into a, a, a framework, rather than focusing on building the next identity manager and that's what the WSO2 guys are doing, and, and they do a great job, so why not use that? So. And then the last one is, of course, with all of this goodness of open source, what I would also say is watch for the licensing model. 
and who is behind it. And um, in, in terms of um, looking at the licensing model, um, we've got bitten a couple of times in smaller instances where there are some fine prints in, prints in some licensing model where you know, it could make all of the stuff that you've done uh, part of open source. So make sure the, the licensing model is the uh, right one so you can use it, but you don't become uh, uh, you know, uh, a victim of that. Now comes the fun part. Why WSO2? So, um, so Devika, I'm only going to talk about the good stuff today. So the bad part, we'll, we'll keep it a private conversation. Um, so one of the things that I was looking for when we were looking at open sources, uh, the other ones that are available out there as well, is the most comprehensive set of solutions. So we wanted to be able to take all the way from writing code to deploying it. Um, so that was, that was one of the criteria for us to go with WSO2. And the other was support and flexibility. Now, Devaka told about um, we were, we've been using the ESB for uh, five or six years now. And it's interesting. Uh, the, the way I came across this was, I think, um, I think Sanjeeva had probably written a paper on ESB. And I happened to read that um, when I was coming back from a flight somewhere. And we were in the middle of uh, an interesting uh, exercise building a, a messaging uh, solution. And we were having some uh, challenges. And, and I, I saw this, and I sent him an email, and I immediately got a response back. And, and I said, hey, this is good. I'm getting good support here. And we sort of started by saying, let's build a proof of concept with maybe getting a, a, a WSO2. So one of my first question was, can you can you give me some support in building this, rather than saying it's open source, download it, it's Java code, figure it out, and use it. And within, within two weeks, I had somebody in, in our office, and we paired him with another developer, and in two weeks' time, we were able to actually put together a proof of concept using ESB. And uh, one of my team members who was there, he's sitting right there, and he can verify the story. Um, so, so that was a, a pleasant surprise. And, from there on, it has been this, this, this extreme sort of um, ability to support is one of the things that um, made us stick with WSO2. And the other one and is the strategic alignment. As I said, my, my goal was always to kind of eventually, I mean, of course, um, WSO2 didn't have that initially. It was, uh, as Devaka said, an ESB and app server, I think, to start with. Um, but the, the, the vision was one day we will have everything from writing the code all the way to deployment, um, things that we could assemble and put together our own platform, and then we could just focus on the application. Uh, so that was uh, uh, the strategic alignment part that, uh, that we shared with WSO2. And the other one is the active community. And of course, it wasn't a, a very big community to start with, but we could go and you know, post a question, go into a community blog site, and ask people, hey, how have you done this? And have you seen this problem? And so that, that community support it was, was another part of um, uh, the, the decision-making process. And then the last one is the track record of executing on a vision. Um, Sanjeeva talked about it this morning. And one of the things that I was always impressed about was, so he comes uh, once in a while even if, when he comes to US, he comes to my office. And we talk about something. So about two years ago, I said, we need, so there is nothing about, you guys are not doing anything about mobility. We need to do something about mobility. And yesterday, I was sitting in the, um, the MDM uh, uh, session tutorial. And I was very impressed, impressed that in, in such a short period of time, um, they were able to take that vision. And, and Sanjeeva said, it's coming. Just wait. We, we will have something uh, in a short window. Uh, and so that is definitely something. So, so the alignment of uh, not only strategic alignment, but also their ability to take a vision to execution. Uh, so that is something that um, we have seen consistently. That mobility was just one example. So those are some of the reasons why we decided to go with um, WSO2. And we continue to kind of um, you know, sort of press and, and, and stress them as much as we could. And, and they haven't uh, broken yet. Um, so this is sort of our high-level architecture view. So I don't know how clear that is from there, but 
Uh, basically, we are not touching the bottom. So infrastructure, as I said, we wanted to be independent of uh, the um, IAS vendors, uh, whether it's Amazon or Rackspace, and even internally, we want we, we have we have uh, franchises that wanted to actually um, deploy applications uh, in house, not go into the cloud. So we wanted to have the same bytecode essentially without much change to be able to port it and deploy it in in these multiple environments. And and this is not a, a slide where this actually has been tested. We actually built an application um, that is now being that's already deployed in the cloud, is being deployed by one of our partners uh, inside um, their, their uh, hosting center. So, so we have all of the core services that you talked about. Again, as I said, we haven't implemented all of them. We have used some of them, but our plan is to kind of enhance and, and build it out completely. As, as I said, you know, this is all application dependent. As we build more applications, so if the next application is demanding complex event processor, we will integrate that into the platform. So it's not a um, let's build everything out and wait and, and let people start using it. So we found this model to be very useful, incremental, very agile. Um, and on top of that is the Trimble shareable services. Um, so these are the, the reverse geocoding type uh, service that I talked about. And on top of that, there's this concept of market-focused services, which is what I call 80-20 um, application. What I mean by this is, you know, I can, I can give you one example, um, asset management, for example. It's sort of a horizontal, everybody talks about asset management, but if you go and talk to a construction guy in the field, um, in, a, in a construction site, and say asset management, he has a completely different idea than somebody who's a field service guy of managing assets. So, but there are some core elements that are similar, you know, your asset registry, your um, way you manage it, um, the way you store it, um, you know, the way you probably scan it through either RFID or uh, barcode. So there are, there are, there's quite a bit of things that are common to all of these different market solutions. So we have this idea of this 80-20 applications that becomes part of this, uh, this, this, this infrastructure. So if you look at the, as you go up, the components, the, 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 the component that you use to assemble these applications becomes more and more coarse. And as you come down, it's, they are much more finer, fine level uh, components. Um, and then, of course, we have all of the other things that you need, you know, monitoring, the uh, auto scaling, and all of that. And on top of that is the, um, is the, are the, are the real market applications. And that's where we want to focus. That's where the business divisions uh, want to focus so that you could, you could bring out new differentiating applications and features, not having to spend a lot of time on uh, in this side. So here. So what does that look like? So, so I've tried to kind of give a slightly different view of the same thing here. So these are some of our divisions, um, ag services and the focus on the agriculture sector, telematic services, um, building services, geospatial. So, so those, those blue bubbles are the core services. Those are all mostly WSO2. Um, uh, I know there's a lot of blue in WSO2 here today. It was just a coincidence. Um, so those are, those are the core uh, TPAS components. And then you have these, um, these services that we, we, we think the, the divisions would build and publish it and make it available and, and be shared by other divisions that comes on top of that and then you have the, the application itself. Um, so the step one, what we did uh, with TPASS, these are the things that we implemented, the API manager, the identity manager, the um, ESB, and, and we put it in a scalable and highly available de deployment infrastructure. Um, and and that, that is done and that is now being deployed. Um, so I'm just, this is, this is probably things that have already been talked about in many sessions. Uh, what is the API manager and why? So this is just to kind of give you a, a little bit more flavor on, you know, why we use the API manager. And all of the services are published through API manager, so we have basically using the API manager as, as a, a mechanism for us to sort of, and it's deployed in a separate layer, and, and you will see that when I um, talk about the deployment architecture. Um, so one of the interesting things we have done here is 
we have actually split the um, API manager into, um, uh, into a, to, a, to make it more scalable. The, the store and publish runs in a different cluster. Um, the, the API gateway nodes that handles all the API traffic, that runs in a separate cluster. And the management node runs in a separate cluster. So again, here, uh, we kind of initially had it all in one. And then we played with it when we, when we got some help from WSO2 guys. And to make it more scalable, we kind of split it up. So this is something, again, we learned through, um, through, the, through the exercise uh, working with them. Um, so again, enterprise service bus, this is something that we have been using for the longest time. We use it for integration. We use it for message routing. We use it for uh, transformation. Uh, in many of these cases, you have um, uh, data needs to be uh, transfer transformed from the origin to destination. Uh, and it's, you know, it, it's a very highly scalable um, infrastructure component. Um, so this is essentially our, um, our uh, um, TPaaS deployment. I don't know how clear it is from, from there. Uh, basically, on top is the, um, so this is actually the uh, TPaaS deployed with an application. Um, so the, the three uh, rectangles here, uh, the, the second, third, and fourth from the bottom, those are basically the, uh, the, uh, the essential elements of the, the pass. Um, you have the, the, webs, the, the web and the application layer on top of that. Uh, it is, uh, it's got an Amazon um, load balancer, uh, both the mobile and the, um, uh, the, um, the web clients come through, um, through the firewall, through that load balancer. We have, through, we have two um, WSO2 elastic load balancers that are again made highly available by putting another um, Amazon load balancer in the middle. Um, so that is one area we're still working on to make sure um, to get it of that um, Amazon load balancer there. Um, we have um, set up some um, easy deployment through some other external tools at this point, which is part of TPASS. So this is, again, our goal is to use as much as possible everything WSO2, but TPASS is um, not only WSO2. If we need to include other things, we would include that as well. Um, so governance model. So this is something that, again, in a, in a corporate structure, in an enterprise like Trimble, you have to be uh, well aware of. Uh, you have to make sure um, to get a clear governance model uh, and structure involving all of the stakeholders. Um, so many times these attempts fail because the stakeholders are either they have staked out their own position uh, or uh, they are not brought into it um, early enough. Um, so and, and of course always make one person responsible making all the final decision. Um, so we are putting together a governance model where it's, it's more like the, the, the open source um, you know, service governance model. Um, rolling deliverables, you have to provide deliverables more often so that, 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 that you know, it doesn't become a bottleneck. Um, and find an evangelist in each team using the platform services. So I found this to be one of the critical things that you not only need to have the acceptance, but you also have, need to have an evangelist in each of these groups so that they become the, the people who push this and also make it um, uh, easy to adapt within those groups. Um, keep the core team small and nimble, which is one of the things we have done so that we don't have a big, huge platform group that everybody is waiting for. Um, keep the core team small and trimble. Make sure to have good support of um, open source components used. So again, back to WSO2. So if you have an open source uh, that you're using, make sure you have good support. Uh, and that's one of the things um, we have experienced with, uh, with the WSO2 team. Uh, and everyone understand the vision and the value of the platform. So it's very important that you not only execute, you kind of give the vision and everybody understands that. Uh, and again, support uh, from all of the, the, the top management as well as um, at, uh, at, the, at, the, uh, at the team level. Um, road ahead and lessons learned. Um, I have only five minutes. I just got the signal already, so I'm going to really go through this fast. Uh, simplify the deployment model. It's very, very important because even if you build the greatest solution and if it takes forever to get deployed, uh, people get frustrated. So uh, this has been one of my focus to make that part very, very uh, easy. Um, don't give too many knobs to turn. That's one of the things that happens when you build with lots of components. You have too many knobs. And if you start doing that, uh, you might have problems. 
and find ways to kind of hide that complexity. Um, bring all the config management across environment using under, under version control, so you don't have the issue of somebody using an older version and everything breaks. Um, and the full application cycle, uh, 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 life cycle management. So um, some of the things that we heard today, uh, the app factor thing, uh, we are very much interested in that. Um, so the whole life cycle management all the way from writing code to deploying is very, very important. And mobile pass, of course. Um, so there is not one enterprise that is not focused on mobility these days. Um, so uh, this is very, very important to us as well. And, and then the final one, um, once you have all of the service, you have to have a facility to go and discover this and start sharing. And we haven't reached that stage yet, but my hope is that by the time we will have the great app store that we can deploy from WSO2 and, and people can do that. Um, that's the story and I'm sticking to it. Questions? Couple of quick questions, anybody? Yes. Could you wait for the mic? <laughs> so what did you do for monitoring your ESB and uh, in your applications? Like, so uh, how do you implement it? What did you implement it for your monitoring piece? So um, you're talking about the application monitoring or specifically the ESB monitoring? Uh, the end-to-end -end stuff. So if it includes both application and the ESB. So um, we have, so the early on we had developed some of our own tools to monitor the thing. So our goal is now to integrate that into the WSO2 framework. And, and also, as I said, um, we are using some third-party tools um, to do some of the application monitoring and, and the deployment. All right, thank you. Oh, sorry, I didn't see that. How about the configuration management? I'm sorry, I can't see where you, you are. Oh, okay, sorry. Uh, you talked about configuration management, so do you use a third party tool for that or uh, do you have something homegrown or is there a WS2 component? So can, you, can you repeat that, integration management? Uh, no, the configuration management. Configuration management, oh, okay. So, um, so we have done some puppet scripting and chef scripting of our own, and we have used a, uh, for now, a third-party tool, um, which is, um, so it's a, it's a white label, uh, it's, a t it's something that you can white label and as well as configure, so um, it looks like a part of Trimble um, offering, so. Hi, Prakash. Yes. Uh, this is Ram from ThoughtWorks. I have a question. I have asked it to several people today. Uh, what is your uh, story like from the time a dev commits a line of code till you take it to production? Oh, that's a long story. Uh, <laughs> um, so I think I know where you're getting at. Um, so if you, if, you, if you ask me, do you have a very seamless flow from the, 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 the time you start writing the code, the answer is no today, it's not. So again, that's why one of the things we're very excited with the, the code envy announcement from WSO2 and, um, but we have internal processes in place as to how you, so we have um, um, the dev area, the, uh, the, sta the QA area, the staging area, and we have our own internal process to move that code through uh, to deployment. Um, but is it, and then that's what I meant by the, the one click uh, model that we want to get to where it's kind of seamless from end to end. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>